my, my thoughts go back to the uh, first ASEAN Inclusive Business Summit in uh, 2017 in Manila. And um, I could not imagine in my wildest dreams that uh, Brunei would be hosting the fourth uh, Inclusive Business Summit uh, in 2021. It's been a fantastic ride and we have come so far. Um, but of course, there's much, much more to go. And uh, we've seen some great examples already um, in the, uh, during the summit here. And today in this session, we will look at a topic in detail, which has been mentioned a few times, the business coaching. How do we help? How do we support companies that want to build Inclusive Business Summit. To discuss this topic, we have put together a fantastic panel. And I'd like to introduce uh, my panelists now. We've got the Honorable Dayang Nikhafimi Binti Abdul Hadi, member of the Legislative Council of Brunei and chairperson of the Yaya San Committee on Social Enterprises, Brunei Darussalam with us. Hello, uh, Nikhafimi. Uh, we've got Namsun Liu, ASEAN Regional Managing Partner of EY out of Singapore. Hello, Namsun. Uh, we've got Ms. Britt DeLang, Country Manager of BOP Inc., uh, Myanmar slash Netherlands. Hello, Britt. And we've got Callum Yap, Manufacturing and Marketing Lead of Okra Solar, Cambodia. So we've got a very varied panel here, which can shed lights on the topic of business coaching uh, from different perspectives. But we have not only a fantastic panel, we also have a fantastic audience. And I really encourage you to share your thoughts, your insights on business coaching for inclusive business with us. So please, everybody, go to the chat box now, tell us your name, and what you think of business coaching. What are your insights? Let us know. And I hope there will be an as engaging uh, dialogue in this chat box as we will have on the panel. And we've organized the panel in a way that we will talk first for about 20 minutes, but then we have 20 minutes where we will uh, answer your questions, uh, your thoughts, uh, respond to them. When we have another second round of questions here on the panel, and we go back again to a dialogue with the audience. So please use this opportunity. We are very curious to learn from you. So how do we get to, to business coaching? Um, it is stated in the guidelines for the promotion of inclusive business uh, in ASEAN as one of the policy instruments uh, necessary or useful to promote inclusive business. And this knowledge um, derived from our uh, inclusive business landscape studies, which were conducted in Cambodia, uh, Malaysia, and uh, Vietnam. So there is a need among the business uh, sector to receive support on building inclusive business models. As in Cambodia, we are now supporting the implementation of the National Inclusive Business Strategy. We uh, have, or this need has been reiterated uh, several times. And interestingly enough, it was also the intermediaries, the consultancies, the chambers of commerce, uh, the associations who see a need, but also great opportunity to connect with their members, to support them on their journey towards more inclusive business models. Um, so IBAN has uh, now engaged in this process. We will be working uh, on a uh, structured guide to inclusive business coaching. And uh, we very much look forward to this process. Uh, but here now today, we will look into more details what is happening already. And again, please join the chat box. So far, I have not seen anybody Please, the first one, be brave enough, say who you are and what you do in terms of uh, business coaching or what your needs are, what you think should be done. So let's start uh, with the first question. Uh, Honorable Nikafimi, social entrepreneurship is an emerging topic in Brunei Jerusalem. 
and your committee supports social enterprises in tackling unemployment and poverty by providing them with training, mentorship, and business opportunity. What kind of training do you undertake to help social enterprises in Brunei to scale up and increase their impact? Uh, good day, Mark Marcus. Hi, how are you? Uh, and greetings, everybody from from Brunei. Um, I think it's been a pretty interesting day with uh, with what ASEAN has put together for the Inclusive Business Summit. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to just share a little bit of insight as to what we've done, um, how we've progressed uh, in Brunei, especially in the in the realm of social enterprise. Um, social enterprise is, is fairly new, fairly uh, within within this particular naming structure. Uh, but I think from coming from the aspect of business coaching um, is the importance of making sure that the clients that come to or are interested, the community that is interested in doing social enterprise um, are equipped with the right type of tools um, to undertake a social enterprise or, or a business in general. Um, and a lot of that could be just very basic um, courses, uh, uh, most of the time provided free of charge uh, by the host organizations uh, from as basic as setting up your business, um, operational uh, business matters, um, how do you market? How do you choose your product um, to launch into, into your social enterprise? Um, even as simple as, you know, understanding how to register a business online. So you'll be very surprised that, uh, I guess, with the community that we work with, uh, we, we, we deal mostly with the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, strata of the community. So we really have to give them the, the principal building blocks of understanding what it is to uh, undertake a business. And, and at the same time, look at the sustainability of where they're headed as they build their own community. So that, that's sort of a nutshell, Marcus, if I can sort of give it a bit of an intro, um, but obviously each level will have different nuances. And this is not just from the, um, the foundations uh, aspect where I am a chair for the committee, but also on the government programs, um, on the programs run by, um, by even private sector individuals, who have their own little um, initiatives that they use themselves to link in and undertake inclusive business um, in, in, from, from a bigger perspective. So I hope that, that sort of gives a bit, a bit of an insight as to what we're trying to do here in Brunei. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nick Hafimi. Uh, Callum, you're um, with Okra Solar, it provides IoT and AI enabled hardware and software to last my energy companies uh, to then can sustainable energize remote off grid communities. Um, the focus of your company lies in Southeast Asia, particularly Cambodia, the Philippines, and Indonesia. So you have been on the receiving side of business advisory and business coaching. Please share with us your experiences and how it helped you on the way uh, to where you are now. Yeah, for sure. And firstly, thank you, Marcus, for the introduction. And I'd just like to say hello to my fellow panelists and everyone joining this great discussion today. So at Opera, we are developing technology to help energize underserved communities around the world. Um, some of the poorest people around the world that are still relying on fossil fuels to get just a few hours of uh, light at nighttime. And so, uh, with our technological solutions, we have managed to make some pretty good traction in uh, enabling a lot of the key stakeholders to make progress towards energizing these last mile communities. And a big part of that is actually really understanding the, the end beneficiaries that are living in these last mile communities and working with local business coaching companies that have the expertise and cultural knowledge of these local populations. So after we received a grant from SNV, uh, we were connected with BOP, Bottom of the Pyramid in Cambodia, who consulted us on how to effectively engage with off-grid Cambodians. And after we went through multiple uh, advisory sessions with BOP, we we're actually very well equipped to go out to the last mile villages and engage them in a way that would uh, benefit our company as well as them, because we are a social impact company after all. 
So it, it was really on this uh, connection between the company and uh, the base of the pyramid where you received support. Um, wh why do you think you, you needed that support? Is that normally not something that is in, it is in an organization? That's something that you have, uh, so if that you are lacking? Yeah, it's a really good question. I suppose you could look at it like this. Our company is started by, was started by a couple of Australians living in Sydney. And a lot of us who joined the company at a really early stage were also from developed countries. Uh, we were very accustomed to modern technologies and we were trying to build a solution that was benefiting not only uh, the, the end beneficiaries, which are people living in areas without energy, but we're also trying to build a solution that benefits the companies that serve them because we are B2B. But before we can build any form of solution, we really need to understand the stakeholders in that value chain. And the, the root stakeholder, you could say, are the people living in these off-grid villages. And a group of you know, young adults coming from developed countries wouldn't really have a, a good grounding in, in the cultural um, norms and the way these people like to live and operate. So we were really in need of this kind of um, advice and understanding. And that's where the business coaching came into a really, um, that's where it really benefited us. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Callum. Um, moving to Brett, uh, you, you have been on the giving side of business coaching, not only to Opera Solar, but to many other uh, companies. And um, you have extensive, Bob Inc. has like a global experience in supporting different types of companies. Uh, to design and deliver commercially and socially viable companies. Um, can you elaborate a bit on your experience on business coaching, on the key lessons uh, that you have drawn out of this? Yeah, sure, Marcus. Thanks. And thanks for, for having us here. And it's very nice to see uh, uh, our friends from Okra here as well uh, to give a bit of a more practical example of how we work. Um, so for Bob Bank, we, we work with companies and it really ranges from like really small micro businesses to big corporates uh, to create these inclusive business models. And broadly, we do this in, in three areas. So we look at inclusive innovation, which is about making products and services that really fit this BOP consumer group. Then we have marketing and distribution, which is obviously about how do we get this um, product or service to the low income uh, groups. And then last but not least, inclusive business empowerment, which is about training and capacity building on inclusive business, where we also do a lot of the coaching as well. Um, we've been doing this for about 10 years as Pop Inc, a bit more even now. Um, we're in 31 countries, so there's really a wide kind of range of sharing of best practices going on. Um, maybe to make it a bit more concrete. So to give you an example on the kind of bigger side of things, we work with, for instance, Unilever uh, on their less mal distribution network. They have these women sales agents that go from village to village around their community um, to sell Unilever products. And we work with their local teams to look at how can we improve the impact of this, maybe add some more impact products to the basket but also look at how does the model work and how can we innovate and improve and maybe digitize. Um, so that's kind of on the, on the bigger corporate side of things. And then we also work in development projects. Um, for instance, recently we've, we've, we're almost closing off a program for the Advancing Women Empowerment Fund uh, funded by USAID and Visa Foundation, where we work with uh, One to Watch, which is a local uh, accelerator and impact investor. And we do business coaching, we do trainings, but here we also did uh, some gender specific um, trainings to really help women entrepreneurs also address the challenges they face um, based on their gender as an entrepreneur. Um, I think here, like for me, this is really like, I get very excited about it. There's like these women entrepreneurs that are really pushing the envelope on the topic. Um, for instance, there's this company called Hydroplant and this lady, she they made a IoT solution for farming 
where they do hydro hydroponic farming. And then we come in and we talk about, okay, how can you make sure that that actually gets accessible to low income farmers as well? And you don't only reach kind of the middle or higher income, bigger farms. Um, so this, this mechanism that we had with Okra, we have with a lot of companies, we basically start at this kind of consumer research, really understanding the customer. And then we work our way back into the business model, marketing distribution. Um, in terms of lessons, because that's what you were asking as well, right? So I can talk about this for hours, but let me give you the most important ones. Um, we we fit, think it's really important that companies understand what inclusive business is, but also how to make it practical for their business. So what I've really personally seen is that once you sit down with a business leader, and that can be at any level, once you talk through what does this mean for your business and how do you make this concrete and practical, that's when they really like get onto it and get excited and want to get into it. So I think that's a really important one. Um, putting the consumer first, I think uh, Callum really hit the nail on the, on, on the, the hammer on the nail uh, there. Um, just maybe to give as some context, I know that for them being kind of these Australian guys going to another country, it's important, but it's important for all companies. And it sounds very straightforward, like look at the consumer, look at their needs, look at their aspirations. But in practice, a lot of companies don't get it right. It really takes time to like really make that, that model work. Um, then a really important one that I think also a lot of companies think is easy, but actually is not, is making the business case work. Like these are models that have very small margins, right? So you have consumers that can afford very high prices. So generally that pressures on the, pre presses on the margins. What you really need to do is look at the unit economics. So make sure it works at a small scale before you start scaling. Because what we've seen a lot is that companies assume that when they get economies of scale, that's when they're gonna have the big income and the profit. But if you can't make it work on a small scale, the odds of you making it work on a big scale are not very high. Um, and then maybe last but not least, and this is maybe a little bit of a personal um, uh, passion, make the coaching also available in local language. I've seen so many super good entrepreneurs in Myanmar that have maybe better businesses than these guys that can do a flashy pitch in English, but they don't speak English. Um, so have some local team members that can take on the coaching, uh, but still share these back best practices from all the different markets. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll leave it to that for now and uh, keep some space for, uh, for questions later. Well, excellent. Uh, thank you, Brett, uh, for, your, for your insight and, and the lessons learned. Uh, I think it's really, really uh, important to keep that in mind uh, when designing uh, inclusive business models. And I think that the good thing is that you, you mentioned about your 10 years of experience. Um, we do have those lessons now. It was much more difficult for the pioneers who had to go through all of this uh, themselves. But now we've got the lessons and we start to get the tools ready for uh, companies who want to go into this space to, uh, to apply them. Um, so one of the like biggest consultancies firms uh, globally who uh, always do these kind of things, develop frameworks and uh, apply them uh, to the business is, uh, is EY. And uh, very happy to have uh, Nam Soon with us uh, who's leading the EY activities in the ASEAN region. So drawing on, on your global experience, um, you've actually developed an inclusive business playbook in cooperation with Acumen to help business navigate this transition towards an IB model. So how did you go on about developing this tool and what are the main features? And then what are your experiences as a leading global consultancy firm in advising large international uh, clients on inclusive business? So first off, uh, thank you, Marcus, and uh, hello, everyone. And uh, you know, it's um, it's and the, and the opportunity to share as well the experience and uh, what we've done in this space. Um, we, before I kind of talk about the the tool in the workbook, it's probably worth setting uh, some context around why 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 we went about doing that. And uh, I want to talk about EY Ripples, uh, which is our global corporate uh, responsibility program. 
It brings together all of uh, the global EY firm of 300,000 people around the world. And we've set forth quite a bold ambition, right? So if you, if you go onto our website, you look at the, the uh, kind of press releases, we want to be able to positively impact a billion lives by 2030. Uh, and, and EY Ripples is really uh, a method for, for which EY can become more inclusive organization ourselves and you know in that process uh, see how we can support others in the journey um you know in in, in with ui ripples we're we focusing on very much supporting the next generation workforce uh, we're helping impact entrepreneurs to scale their businesses we're accelerating environmental sustainability which is a big topic uh, for all uh, stakeholders organizations big or small uh, this time and um, many of the entrepreneurs that we support through UI Ripples are innovating and scaling uh, inclusive uh, business models. So we, we've, we've developed a wide range of, uh, you know, kind of different capability building services, new ones towards the size of the organization, um, you know, the, the, the environment and the uh, regulatory landscape that they operate in, in order to take them to the next step of the, of the growth journey, right? And, and that work ranges from, consulting projects, um, you know, to address whether specific barriers to business growth, uh, to business clinics, uh, coming up with coaching programs, innovation events uh, that we do quite often, uh, runs we run with groups of entrepreneurs in collaboration also with uh, accelerator programs and impact investors, a uh, very important part of the uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, and leveraging kind of digital tools and resources uh, that we can make available to all kind of uh, impact entre entrepreneurs globally. So uh, in the last financial year, um, we uh, have over 300 initiatives that were delivered through EY Ripples this is globally. A large part of that uh, is increasingly uh, is, is in the ASEAN marketplace. Uh, we've, we've kind of run through 7,000, more than 7,000 plus impact uh, entrepreneurs spanning across 50 countries to help them scale uh, market-based solutions addressing the United Nations SDGs. So to kind of bring it to life, I'll, I'll just give two examples maybe, right, in terms of how we are helping uh, some of these inclusive businesses scale. Um, ATAC uh, is a biodigester uh, business that's serving uh, rural households in Cambodia. Uh, and the proposition is to turn kitchen uh, farm human waste into biogas and organic fertilizers. Uh, and create that transformational impact for rural households. So, uh, you know, we have, uh, in, 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 and part of that is also looking at uh, increasing crop use uh, and creating a smoke-free cooking environment, uh, thanks to the biogas uh, fuel appliances supplied uh, with the biodigester. So we've had an EY team work full-time uh, with ATAC for a period of two months uh, through the EY Ripples program that I spoke about. Uh, to help review also the expansion strategy into Bangladesh, you know, and uh, positioning the business to be uh, capable of scaling up and serving 100,000 people by uh, 2024. Uh, another kind of live case study is Splash. Now, Splash is a safe water organization that brings safe water, uh, clean hands and toilets to uh, children across Nepal, Cambodia, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam. And uh, UI helped to uh, kind of help uh, prepare a, a business plan for production and the sale of new generation of drinking and hand washing stations. Uh, we looked at the, the business model, the operating model for expanding Splash's uh, water kiosk business. And the aim is to continue to grow growth um, and, and kind of impact the lives of, you know, targeting a million children by 2023. So you, you could see, I, I think some of these is uh, that the purpose, the UI purpose around ripples, the intent, some, and some of the uh, cases uh, that is coming to, to life in ASEAN. Uh, there's, I think there's a lot more we, we could do in, in this region uh, relative to, to some of the other more perhaps um, mature marketplaces. And then coming back to, I, I guess, the question around inclusive business playbook. Uh, this is a playbook that we're quite proud of. We, we developed this uh, in collaboration with uh, global social impact investor acumen and um, you know we we believe business has a responsibility uh, to help create a more inclusive uh, more sustainable more trusted form of capitalism uh, you know business has a collective force uh, there's a huge you know, emo, enormous op opportunity to do good um, and to address kind of, kind of the social imbalances uh, um, uh, you know kind of uh, inequalities that we have uh, in, in in the world that we live in and so, um, you know, Acumen is, is, is a firm uh, that, you know, we both, between EY and Acumen, we both felt that there's a gap in the market uh, around how business leaders can actually make this change, right? Uh, 
how can they actually in practice accelerate the shift to a more inclusive form of capitalism so uh, you know cut a long story short over the last 12 months uh, a joint ey and acumen team uh, we've had uh, working group meetings every other week and we developed this framework and we had identified uh, kind of eight business leaders from across both acumen and ey spanning different sectors different geographies um, you know which we felt best and embodied the principles of the framework so hopefully with this playbook um, businesses both large and small uh, can have a better idea of how they can be truly purposeful, you know, to build inclusive businesses, be inclusive. And I think uh, some of the other panelists talked about, you know, to be to be very sustainable as well. Um, I, I, I think there was a question around large clients as well. I think just to kind of make sure I don't overrun on my, on my time segment here, I, I think first of all, it's probably I want to say, you know, being an inclusive business is not just for large enterprises, you know, all businesses, uh, regardless of size, regardless of sector or market, you know, they have the ability uh, to implement steps towards, uh, you know, achieving that goal, uh, impact uh, plus profit. Now, obviously, um, you know, whether you're a large client or, or smaller size uh, firm, there, there are differences in terms of capacity to build, uh, you know, availability of capital, capital uh, and so on. Uh, but I think there's this increasing recognition across all companies that to be profitable to shareholders, is not enough. Uh, it's got to be sustainable. It's got to be competitive uh, business in the long run, and uh, it's got to be inclusive uh, in in all of that. So the whole kind of ESG, and as we know, the S part of the ESG is now you know increasingly more and more important. The COVID COVID nineteen uh, pandemic has uh, you know cast cast greater spotlight on ESG concerns. So therefore, being good uh, makes extremely good business sense. Um, a lot of business owners and big big company CEOs realize that. And it, everyone needs to kind of strive towards a more inclusive uh, business. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I think you're touching on, a, on an interesting point. It's also connected to a question from the audience, which I'll be picking up. Uh, you described like EY ripples, uh, and um, it's uh, it's an interest, like a fantastic program. And then you describe more your like a core business of advisory. Uh, with with the companies, and you say there's more and more now the yes in the ESG uh, coming up. Um, do you really like like see that already happening on an operational level? We know there's a lot of discussions on the board level, or on, even on the advisory level part on how to do it. But do you actually get contracts now, like paid advisory? Uh, to uh, to do this, or is there still more like CSR in the EY uh, ripples uh, sector? Because that touches on one of the questions: who pays for this? So the the, the short answer is that I think uh, you know, quite frankly, in the last twelve months, especially in the last six months, uh, there there are clients that are, are starting to pay. Um, I I wouldn't say they're great rates uh, relative to uh, <laughs> what we <laughs> do as a as a business. Uh, but there's, there's good reason for that as well. Um, you know, it, it is an emerging space. Uh, it gets more difficult, I think, when it gets to some of the smaller size um, firms, right, uh, who are trying to really move the needle on, on, you know, social issues and all that. And, and that's where EY repos really comes in, right, because we're not expecting the kind of, uh, as in, in, in some instances, it's sweat capital that we put in. We're not, we're not expecting kind of payback in the form of financial returns. But in terms of the large corporates, I I would, I would dare say that uh, what's happening now is that there, there's really two topics that when we talk to CEOs uh, with the large corporates, you know, one is around digitalization uh, and the other one is around sustainability and inclusive businesses. So uh, this whole, whole area around stakeholder capitalism. Um, so we, we are getting paid. We're looking at various things from uh, looking at the strategy, uh, looking at how they might refine the operating model, looking into how they, and I mentioned the example about uh, getting into another country in Bangladesh, for example, uh, getting to new markets and, you know, um, getting EY for help with regards to regulatory advice or tax advice and, and the consulting piece or, or in, in that respect as well. But yes, you know, it's, it's uh, I would say it's heartening to see. And I, I think this is going to accelerate in, in, in some of the markets. Um, uh, in a, and I, I got a kind of, you know, a, a panelist have talked about this. You know, ASEAN is, uh, is not one single market. Um, you know, it's, it's very diverse. So, you know, if you look at some of the more mature markets in, from, in terms of kind of gov government support and so on, there's, there's, um, the, there's big focus. And government support and policies are, are very important. Um, I think as Hafimi is uh, well-placed to talk about this, 
Um, but at the same time, I think um, you know the the a lot of bots. It's gone. It's gone beyond beyond the bots, right? Uh, so every time we kind of talk about this topic, we get the uh, a lot of questions around how how do you help us operationalize this, right? Uh, so so yeah, it's all it's all it bodes quite well, I think, in terms of uh, what we're trying to do here uh, in terms of moving the needle. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. It, it's great to hear um, because I think that's when the rubber hits the road when people have to start paying. Uh, for something and it's 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 great to hear that this is is happening now um maybe over to brett i mean also with your experience is that a, a similar trend you're you're seeing yeah so for us it's like i've always been that some of the bigger corporates we work with have just paid us like a consulting rate so that that's been around for quite some time i think generally maybe for us the situation is a bit different because we're a non-profit right so we don't have to make like a really big return. Um, and what you do see is like these big corporates, they can pay a consulting fee, but then if you go to the SMEs, maybe they can make like a small contribution. So you wanna at least cross subsidize with some donor funds. Um, and then if you go to a micro business, there's just no way in the world that they're gonna pay a consultant to help them out. But what you see is that these kind of blended programs work really well, where maybe you give a little bit of the consulting or the coaching uh, for free, uh, funded by other stakeholders or uh, on a pro bono basis. And then that kind of gets the ball rolling and then gets them to understand what is kind of needed and what they wanna do. And then it can happen quite often that they start wanting to invest and pay for it. So I think it's a bit the similar trend uh, that we're seeing. It's just maybe from a different angle. And I think there's some size businesses that are just never gonna gonna be able to afford this themselves so there it really needs to be a multi-stakeholder effort um but there is there is enough development programs that focus on that group okay um thank you well callum from your side you had mentioned that you received a grant from snv uh to to do this business coaching um, but you've progressed. Uh, so would you nowadays be able or willing to pay for it? Yeah, I think if we were to explore a new market where we didn't have any good connections or any, any knowledge of how to navigate that market, I think it's something that we would consider strongly. We usually get this type of information through general conversations with people working in that market, but a dedicated business coaching uh, advisory firm, I think would actually go a really long way. However, that's my personal opinion. Um, when it comes to actually making the transaction, there's a lot of people involved in deciding what, what the knowledge gaps are and how important it is that uh, you know, it's, it's paid for. But I would like to think that we would, we would put some money towards uh, getting business coaching, especially in a scenario where, where we're not familiar with any of the uh, local terrain. Okay. No, no, I think that's, uh, that's, that's good, to, good to hear. Um, Nick Hafimi, uh, on, on your perspective, uh, do, do you see in, in Brunei uh, companies or social enterprises willing uh, to pay or being able to pay your services or what is your plan? regarding I think, sustainability I mean, yeah i guess i guess you know I'm, I'm i'm agreeing with with my fellow panelists here because i think there's always a cost associated to everything um my own background is in business anyway so so you know there, there has to be cost to service delivery um in whatever shape way or form now you may not necessarily uh put the burden onto one organization you could split you know, you could split the costs across multiple organizations. I think one interesting thing that we found that um, even working with the community, especially on the social enterprise, is, um, you know, they're, they're very, um, they, they don't like, they're, they're quite proud of where they come from. And, and they would rather, you know, even if it's a small sum, it may not necessarily be a fixed cost for them, but as long as they've put forward a token sum, to some sort of training program, you know, they feel that they can benefit from it. Uh, so, and I think that's something we have to remember as well. Um, not everyone from that strata wants to always be provided help in that way. They also want to help themselves. So I think, you know, and I agree with Britt um, earlier that the, the language is so crucial. Um, and, 
and in I guess in the 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 undertaking that we've had, um, albeit in a small way for social enterprise in Brunei, is that we've given the opportunity to the community that have, that participate to be the ones to do the step forward. So you know, just now we were talking about costs. I think costs should be always integrated to everything because that's the reality of what we live in, um, especially if you want to improve. Uh, but we do it in different forms. We can do it in a, in a credit format whereby you either pay it forward through something else, you go and help another two or three individuals and you can, you know, you can ascertain a value to that. And, and for us who are training or, or coaching providers, we ascertain that as a value. So I think that's one way you know, you can quantify and, and, and you can enable your participants to consider payment in that, in that sense. So, but I think that's crucial because that, that makes the social enterprise and the whole idea of inclusive business coaching um, part and parcel of how they develop their, their organizations. Um, and secondly, obviously, you know, I think governments are very supportive in, in grant provision, et cetera, et cetera but not everybody can afford it, even from a government perspective, uh, because governments have to think, okay, where am I going to get the funding to, to do all this? So a lot of the programs that we've done is that, you know, the, the, the private and the public um, joint venture uh, partnership. Uh, and you see a lot of this now, especially within the innovation space, uh, whereby the, uh, a, a bigger player wants to roll out, you know, some sort of initiative they, they work together with the community, um, especially within the social enterprise space, try and test out these formulations. Um, if there's a benefit for it, if there's a way to commercialize it, then the, the benefits get split into two. So, you know, they, the, the bigger corporation would put in their expertise, they would get the boots on the ground with testing it out. I mean, that's other ways that you can, you know, you can sort of... Um, look at a charging aspect from it, you know, a cost aspect from it to, to enable um, a, a little bit of a sizable return uh, back to those uh, bigger corporations. Because ultimately, you know, we are, we are uh, beholden to the people that own the companies um, and that's the reality of life. Um, and, I, and I take again on uh, Namsoon's point that the, for us in Brunei, because others in the region have already been very well versed in social enterprise, we're learning, we're, we're picking off the best of the best and trying to formulate it within our community um, to what's suitable for us. But definitely ESGs are there, um, they will not go away. Um, and you know, if you look at the policy and you can see this very strongly in Europe where you're from, um, it's, it's even going to be, you know, it's even within legislation. So you can only see that wave moving through, um, especially when we talk about that S word, not just the social aspect, but the sustainability aspect. So I hope that that answers some of um, the questions, Marcus. Thank you. Yeah. No, excellent. Uh, I think you're, you're raising very important points here about government support for this one. Um, and I will uh, so formulate another question from the uh, audience in, in this direction. But before I do that, uh, I, I know I've seen that we've got about 80 participants here in this call. That's fantastic. Um, but I, I don't know, I have not seen a lot of your 80 of you here in the chat. So um, if everybody can just sort of at least post a little emoji how they're feeling right now, it would really help us here on the panel to see that we are not talking into an empty space, but there are real people uh, connected to these uh, names in the participants list. So, so please do uh, give us an emoji how you're feeling uh, right now. And if you have any uh, like other thoughts, uh, maybe this sort of triggers a little um, uh, so some encouragement for you to post your questions uh, to us. So, okay, I can see there, there are real people behind these participants. Thank you so much. Uh, it makes me feel much, much uh, better um, because, um, yes, uh, I'm here in the home office as we are still under COVID restrictions here in Germany and to see con being connected to all of you with some uh, real emotions does help and gives energy. And um, taking this energy uh, from you now, there was a question in the, in the panel about redirecting um, government support. There's a lot of like government programs for SMEs, for innovation, for farmers, um, 
how can we sort of use some of those fundings to direct them to inclusive businesses that then work with the farmers or with the SMEs? So it's a bit the idea that you're not government to convince government not to try it themselves working directly with their core constituencies or with their main beneficiaries, but channel it through an inclusive business who may be able to do this more efficiently. Like thinking about good agricultural practice, for example, I think companies like East West Seeds and, and other Kenema Foods, other inclusive businesses here would probably do this uh, more efficiently than a government. Plus they already have an access to market for the products that then are being developed out of those capacity programs. What, what are your sort of experiences or thoughts on this? Are you seeing this? Do you see an opportunity also made to the two consulting firms here that such a blended model could actually work in, um, in, in your segment? Uh, maybe Britt first, uh, how do you see that developing? Yeah, thanks, Marcus. I think um, I think it's definitely a, a good angle to to look at. Um, maybe just to share a bit practically from my own experience, we've been working with the the, the NAF facility, which is an FCDO fund mechanism in Myanmar, um, working with all sorts of different stakeholders on what is inclusive business, raising awareness, but also making it very practical. What can you do to help? And we've also sat down with some government entities that are supposed to support businesses and talk them through like, what can you do to actually help people start inclusive businesses or help them foster it and see this as a mechanism to also reach their bigger picture goals, right? Um, unfortunately, of course, with the recent political changes, we had to hold this work, but we really did start seeing a lot of appetite and a lot of engagement with different ministries reaching out and different organizations saying okay we we really want to do something on this um i think if these government organizations see the link between their bigger picture government role and seeing that you know a lot of these markets there's a very big bop community that still needs to be supported that business can go together with that. It's it's kind of like an easy or an obvious um, uh, way to to kind of bring two goals together. So yeah, I think it can really work. I think the way to kind of uh, foster that or help governments uh, make that practical is is just to start with the engagement and start discussing and start having conversations about what does that practically mean? Because I think that's where a lot of them, or at least in my experience, where, where it often gets stuck. Um, Dana set up in Myanmar this steering committee with some government agencies, but also different stakeholders to just foster the dialogue between an investor or an entrepreneur's association saying, this is what we need to actually do inclusive business and then make sure that they get supported to, to make that move. Um, yeah, so I think uh, there's there's a good angle there, and I think it definitely should be looked at. Yeah, well, Namsoon, from from your perspective, do, do you see this as a viable business model for EY to work with governments? Yeah, no, mo mo most definitely, right? I, I think just to build upon what uh, Britt said about uh, kind of that collaboration, you know, I if I draw an analogy, there's especially here in this part of the world, in ASEAN, the, the whole uh, you know, concept of bringing together public and private partnership. Uh, you know, infrastructure, for example, is we've talked about it for years. It still continues to be a problem with regards to kind of getting that partnership going. Um, I'm, I'm, it's a bit of a general statement, but uh, you know, where but where we've been able to get that to work, and I think it will apply equally to kind of inclusive businesses. Is uh, you know, we, we, that's the best way to kind of deliver the outcome. So if if an organization can deliver an outcome. Uh, better than well, you know, as good as government or better than government, then then it makes a lot of sense for kind of us to work. Uh, and oftentimes we 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 see ourselves as playing a bit of an orchestrator role to kind of bring uh, you know both government and some of these organizations uh, together. Uh, I think the other point I would make that here in ASEAN, there's actually a lot of large uh, conglomerates right across in the Philippines, uh, in Thailand, in Indonesia, and elsewhere, and then actually in a very good position. Uh, the kind of uh, you know get get um, you know derive kind of the outcomes that we want in reaching out uh, you know as they as they 
look out to serve their, their customers. So Indonesia, for example, you know, big, big geography and a huge financial inclusion uh, uh, agenda as they, they go about and, and you know, reaching out to the customers, delivering those, those what's required, uh, the, the ability to kind of factor in uh, and, and the, the thoughts around sustainability, around inclusive business, leveraging on, on government uh, as we get into some of the areas outside of Jakarta is going to be quite key, right? So, so yeah, I mean, in, in, you know, it's a long about way of saying uh, the, the answer is yes, I, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, in, in, in ASEAN for sure. Look, to, turning to our government official here, uh, Nick Hafimi, so there's a lot of demand on, on your uh, scarce resources. Um, how do you react? Okay, first and foremost, I'm not exactly a government official. I, you know, <laughs> I'm linked to it. Sorry, yes, um, <laughs> but in the public sector. Uh, I, I, I can work within the system. Um, look, I think, I think for all intents and purposes, um, uh, governments also understand that their methods of undertaking is a very different approach compared to the private sector. You know, you're at two different ends of the, of the spectrum. Accountability um, is first and foremost governance where does the money end up? Because the money doesn't belong to you. You are a steward of that that government, that public purse, right? So, sec but at the same time, you also have to fulfill the 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 requirement of supporting the strata of society that needs that uplifting. So, where you know where where the where do the two ends meet? And I think this is where the effectiveness of the private sector um, has been the main vehicle for for governments to work closely with. Uh, because the private sector will take that element of risk, run the program, initiate the program, understand where the program will end up. Um, but at the same time, for all good programs, they will have determined outcomes that will enable this program to be sustainable. So I think that moving towards more of this collaborative model, for lack of a better word, uh, a, a, a public-private incubator model, living laboratory um, set up. I think this has been the, the mechanisms that have been more successful over the many years of collaboration um, that, that the private and that private sector has always had with government. Um, and I think you will see more and more of this model because it is also the same time that understanding that society, uh, be it private, public, civil society, has to be more responsible on sharing the load. It is not just the government that takes that lead, but it could also be vice versa, a joint lead. So I think I think you see that little bit of that shift, especially with the new generation. I think with the with the millennial generation, the ability to take control of their own um, destiny becomes a little bit more crucial compared to the you know past generations of well you know the government being there, I, they lead by example. They are the ones that shape the mold. Um, I think you'll you'll see because of that generational shift, um, the the move towards a, a more shared responsibility um, is really uh, coming to the forefront, and I think that's a good thing. I don't think that's you know you don't want it to be too out of control. You want a, a, you want a supportive ecosystem that manages it, uh, but at the same time you want all sectors of society to, to be more responsible um, about taking care of each other. And I think that's been the beauty of what's happened over the past 10, 15 years, especially within the social enterprise space and the social enterprise ecosystem, it is being led uh, by individuals who have just felt that, look, you know what, I'm gonna make a change. Um, and early on, there was a lot of, you know, in another session that I was listening to another program today, is that, you know, the effective change makers are the ones that are really living the life um, and, and actually experiencing it compared to somebody who is within a government mechanism, not that there's anything wrong with that because they still have to put the laws, the policies in place, um, but they can feedback. I think that's what we've learned a lot in Brunei. Um, and even in, our, in my experience as a, you know, when I, when I was uh, in the young entrepreneur sort of strata is that the government learned as well from the NGOs that grouped together, you know, and then they, they actually came back and said, you know, how do I tweak this policy so that it works more effectively? So I think you'll see a little bit more of that openness in dialogue, um, definitely as we move ahead in, in trying to, to shape this, this model of inclusive business. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a very positive thing from, from one hand, uh, but at the same time, because you do have governments who are listening 
and actually saying, look, I need your help to, to move it forward um, for, for my country. So hopefully that, that, that can capture some of the, 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 the sentiment behind it, Marcus. Thank you. <laughs> okay, no, no, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to let's sort of dig a little bit deeper in, into the content of such business coaching um, and, and also look at the, the different ways of delivering it. Um, the most like a cost efficient way is doing cohorts. Uh, so, so having like one program for say 20 companies. Um, on the other hand, you've got one-on-one -on -one consulting, uh, which is much, much more expensive. However, very targeted. Um, talking to, to Callum, and, and I, I talked to your colleague before, and he said that like uh, they had uh, would have liked to have some like support coaching on how to deal in a regulate, very regulated environment. Uh, you're, you're working in energy, access to energy that's highly, highly regulated. And to find your way around this was extremely cumbersome and you would have liked to have coaching. What like a general like cohort program be helpful for you or would you need really one-on-one -on -one, uh, consulting? And I will then turn to my other fellow panelists here to, to share their thoughts on, on this uh, sort of spectrum of, of business coaching that can be given. Sure. I think one-on-one -on -one delivery would be more effective in, in terms of uh, any kind of teaching or advice, regardless of what you're trying to teach. Uh, and when it comes to what we really struggled with, it was, it was very much related to the fact that we are a B2B company. When we worked with COP Inc., um, we learned some really amazing techniques like the Atia framework, which helped us develop marketing content that was connecting us with the end beneficiaries. And that was super useful for the early days when we were still trying to understand how all of the stakeholders uh, work and think and operate. Uh, but as we grew and we scaled, we needed to start reforming to our initial plan, which was to be B2B, as we think we can create more impact if we enable the local businesses that are working with the local communities, as opposed to working with the local communities directly. And so in just the same way that the, the local people living in these villages have a culture and a normal way of doing things, so do the businesses working in that country. And I think it would have been extremely helpful for us to, to have learned more about that. Um, you know, for example, in Cambodia, there are some business traditions uh, a lot of it is based on relationship building, obviously, um, but some things are quite different from even working in the Philippines, which is not too far away. And then things become more drastically different when you start working in uh, underserved areas like Nigeria, where the, the business landscape and the way in which you interact with other business people is completely different. So having some, some kind of base or some kind of uh, advice on, on how to navigate the business landscape of, of a local country would have been uh, super helpful. And we, we actually think um, this is probably something that a lot of IB coaches are starting to think about as well, especially for B2B clients. Thank you, Callum, uh, for, for this. Uh, Britt, is the what are your sort of determinants between sort of like cohort style and, and, and the one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, is that also like something that can be visualized as like a start, you start first with cohorts and then later on you go on, on the one-on-one? -on -one? Because the, the, I think the great opportunity that we have right now, there's so much interest uh, in, this, in this topic. And, and how do we now move sort of beyond the pioneers? Yeah. How do we then bring it into the broad landscape? We cannot, uh, I think th there's not enough money out there and you cannot work forever for free to allow one-on-one -on -one consulting for the say hundreds of like medium and larger companies who are interested to do this. How, so how do we do this in an efficient way? Yeah, Marcus, I think it's, um um group-based versus one-on-one coaching both has its benefits 
And it depends a bit on the situation and the topic that uh, the company needs help on, what is most effective. Like if you look uh, on platforms like the Global Distributors Collective, which is this, this platform with 200 less mile distributors that share knowledge, we do trainings with them. Um, it can be super effective to address topics that all of them are facing, like challenges all of them are facing. Um, I think also training and cohort based uh, coaching can be effective when there's kind of a, a basic knowledge that still needs to be developed. Um, so for instance, uh, in the Dana work, we had this online training for just to get kind of the basics, what is IP, get some examples, get some basic understanding that will already kind of put a ground for coaching later on, because then you are more cost effective because you don't have to start explaining all the basics still. Um, I think for some situations when there's very specific challenges, but also when companies get to the stage where they're going from developing their model to piloting and then actually trying to make it work on the ground, that's I think where one-on-one -on -one coaching is super valuable, especially when you can, as a coach, go and see the business, go to their shops, talk to their customers, see how it works in practice, because very honestly, these low income markets, nothing happens as it's written out on paper. So it's just good to be there, stand next to the entrepreneur or the team from the company and make sure that you really see what's happening in practice and can point out those things that maybe um, can be improved based on best practices from other markets. So I think there's a role for both. Um, in terms of scalability, these platform functions uh, are very important, I think. We've also had now with COVID very um, good results with blended coaching and training setups. So you would have a training and then uh, maybe have a big group of entrepreneurs follow the content and maybe use a tool to apply it to their business. And then we sit down with them one-on-one -on -one just to make the time efficiency for, for the coaches uh, more uh, better balanced. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's something to say for both. I agree with you. It's not endlessly scalable to do free coaching, but uh, there's uh, there's a catalyst function uh, to that. I think. Uh, Namsoon, your your perspective. You know, so you know, we are we are consulting firm, so we've got to have a methodology for all all segments, right? So there's there's. The <laughs> There's definitely, I, I think, just to expand upon what Britt and Caleb said, there's definitely, I think, for those large platforms, we use that, uh, you know, in, in addition to, you know, perhaps at a higher level to, to, to create awareness around regula regulations or, uh, or business opportunities to kind of do good. In addition to that is uh, kind of the networking around it, right? So to, for entrepreneurs to kind of draw inspiration from each other. So earlier in the year, I, I recall, uh, I, I was one of six uh, kind of the regional leaders that uh, had, we had kind of five entrepreneurs come on, social impact entrepreneurs, uh, talk about you know, how they've been able to, to, to um, you know, what they've been doing in their businesses. And I think that that kind of networking is, is also a, an, an element of, um, you know, and, and a kind of a positive outcome of uh, creating platforms like this. Now, to back to Caleb's point, I think absolutely, if you want to drive the outcome, if you really, and to, you know, Britt, I like what you said about, you know, you... <laughs> especially with some of these um, uh, enterprises, um, you really have to get down to what's, uh, you know, kind of lift the covers and, you know, help them uh, uh, assess the situation because you don't know, they don't know what they don't know. And we, we don't know what we don't know at the same time. Uh, so it, it, you really have to kind of get into the details. And that's where I think the EY repos are leveraging on the, uh, uh, you know, our, 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 our global network firm, the member firm. So we, we're not going to be, kind of uh, all, all assuming to say we have a centralized team that understands what happens in Laos or Cambodia. We draw upon our, our member firms, right? The, the, the folks that we have on the ground, work with them, look at best practices, where they can be applied elsewhere in different countries. And I think that's that's the, uh, you know, leveraging the, uh, the power of a, of a large firm. Uh, but it's hard, it's hard work, I think, getting, getting to kind of the last mile. So, uh, but uh, definitely very fulfilling. Hey. I think that's uh, that's very much uh, much true, and, and I mean, from Iban's side, we, we also have seen this this need for very basic uh, introductory uh, education, 
and, and training. Uh, so, so we have developed uh, this um, introduction to inclusive business uh, e-learning course. Um, and just today, it has been um, launched in the ASEAN SME Academy. Uh, so you can, you can find it there. Um, and I think this will also help the consultancy firms so they don't have to uh, explain the definition and the ecosystem from G20 anymore, but you can refer uh, to this, this resource. Uh, we are also developing a next uh, course now, uh, specifically on scaling and developing IB models where we introduce tools that are available uh, for developing inclusive business models. Um, not in a way that we um, people who take the course will be able to do this immediately, but I think just the knowledge that such uh, tools are around already helps from an introductory uh, point of view to then go on for the like a blended or cohort learning and then to the one-on-one -on -one, uh, conclusion. I think we have not really sort of captured yet the sort of all the efficiency of e-learning. I think there's still much more uh, to explore. And uh, my colleague from the ASEAN Secretariat has just posted the link uh, to, this, uh, to this course. So here I encourage the consultancies uh, to, to use those uh, free and open learnings also when you reach out to, uh, to this new constituency. Uh, so having been a consultant myself, um, I found myself like preaching a lot to the, to the converted mm -hmm. and, and working with the converted to become better and better. Uh, but there was always the challenge to reach out. How do I go to a mainstream business and, and convince them and, and I um, have to admit that I have not been successful in this at all because there was no understanding from the other side. Uh, so I was preaching against a, a black wall. But now as, as I feel, and, and you have confirmed, uh, this, has, this wall has crumbled and, and there is demand. And, and I think we have to sort of come up with solutions uh, how to fulfill uh, this demand from, from mainstream businesses to enter this uh, space. And this is, I think it's always there's the window of opportunity. So if we are able to go now in with a convincing uh, story and a convincing uh, concept, then probably this will uh, continue and, and uh, actually uh, be, uh, be successful. Um, I also want to sort of look with you a little bit into the future. Um, so we've discussed the, the current status. We, we agree that there is a momentum, that it's good. What has to happen uh, in the uh, in the future uh, to make this step from the pioneers to to the mainstream, um, but also from like a like a company's perspective, um, as you're sort of moving from a small business to a growing business, as you're looking to scale, what kind of uh, sort of coaching uh, would then be uh, required? That probably is very different from the kind of introduction that we have. Uh, discussed uh, before. So asking, asking Callum, uh, so if, if you sort of imagine Okra Sola now in, in four or five years time, what kind of support do you need to, to fulfill that vision to, to go where you want to go? That's, there's a lot of things that we need to be supported with in order to achieve the goals we want to achieve. Uh, in my mind, we will be working more and more with a lot of people in the regulatory space, especially as we scale up our impact and the types of companies that we work with are also closely uh, tied with regulators. So I think some kind of support from uh, people people in the, in the government departments would go a long way. Um, grant funding is obviously always welcome as well. But I think the strongest form of support will come from the, the regulatory space for us. Um, Britt, to, to you, can, can you sort of foresee some kind of like collaborative structures of intermediaries of um, business associations uh, coming together uh, to help uh, facilitate this uh, this move? Yeah, I think it's already kind of starting a little bit. I think what you're saying about that there's really a momentum right now is very true. 
Um, and maybe, of course, we get this question quite a bit, especially when we're designing new programs and stuff with, uh, with donors. I think broadly what you see there is there's like this global trend of more impact business and maybe some markets are a lot further in that than others, but you do see that there's appetite and that people are keen. I think um, um, there is still some some step to be made to just get more businesses informed and also understand what it practically means for them. Um, so structures that can help there are, are like the program that we did with the Dana facility I was mentioning, where it's really like a multi-stakeholder effort um, where we did training and capacity building for different stakeholders, where we sat down with a few of these change maker, pioneers, innovators, however you want to call them, um, that you can help along and help grow. Um, so that is definitely step one. And there's there's these structures, there's the global distributor collective type of platforms, also like business call for action, uh, but also programs like Transform, where they help one company in each market or two companies per market, but then really promote it and make sure that they showcase it so that other people see it and learn about what it is in practice and how it can work. And then I think the second step that you have to take companies through would be to make it very practical. So Marcus, you were already referring to tools. I think that's one thing. I think it's also about the coaching where you really apply it uh, so that these companies have this like aha moment, like this is what it means for me and this is what I can do with it. Um, this part, of course, is harder to scale. It's harder to have a collaborative structure that skills that. I think we've touched upon that quite a bit. Um, but then the third, and that is maybe the, the harder part, is really this, this next step of implementing and taking companies to like pilot different solutions and then really make it work in practice. If we have enough companies that show this, showcase them, kind of create this critical mass of, of companies that, that are doing this and making it a normal part of their day-to-day -day business and are sharing this, I think that will have a, a catalytic effect. So then other companies will follow suit and learn about it and, and um, push forward on it. So I think some, you were talking about structures, I think some are things like multi-stakeholder efforts the peer learning, group coaching, uh, platform type of approaches, just really promoting, showcasing what's already happening, but also thinking about smart partnerships. So for instance, if you work with a local entrepreneurs association, train them to provide the coaching. And then maybe for like the super challenging cases, you still bring in like a professional expert, uh, but then you can, can reach more companies and really kind of have these these structures in place that create and that support this this general general push that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. But talking about about tools, um, EEY has developed uh, this inclusive business playbook. Um, and I'm soon. How do you sort of encourage? It's out there now, so, so that's great. But do you see an uptake? And and what what do you do to um, sort of encourage companies to, to use it? Or, and do, do you use it in your practice, in your day-to-day -day work? We, we're going to have to, I, the answer must be yes. Um, I think he has just frozen. Um, or, or is it me who is frozen? Uh, maybe Britt, can you? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. I just thought that it was a very short yeah. answer, but you're right. He is right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can, uh, the, the organizers yes. can, can reach out to, to Namsoon and uh, get him uh, back on again and uh, un unfreeze him. Um, and uh, let's uh, then, in, in the meantime, um, look at uh, so Nick Hafini. So how, how do you, uh, you mentioned that Brunei has, is, is only starting to get into it. Um, how, how do you see this, the, the business coaching progressing in the next couple of years? Uh, I, think, I think Marcus, to be, on, to be honest with you, I think business coaching um, in, 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 this, in, the, in the mechanism or in the format that you're 
uh, that that Ivan is talking about it. It's still um, they're still trying to understand it. I think the general business community is still trying to understand it. But I think it's always underlying. It's always been there in an underlying form. You know that that word CSR um, has always been been present. Now, how do we then, um, at the same time, also explain that the the benefits of investing in you know um, IB coaching um, will actually reap uh, a, a, a better approach in the longevity of your company, or even in the you know the, the whole sustainability aspect of your company? So I think it's really more um, at, at our current position. Um, I think we we should advocate for it. I think we should. Um, push the envelope a little bit more and actually even have one-on-one -on -one sessions with companies and explain to them like, you know, very thoroughly, what is the purpose of inclusive business coaching? Um, what is the purpose of, of and, and the impact that you, you, you can and will create um, and actually get it down to basics and actually explain, you know, have a, have honest conversations with, um, with businesses because then they can see the bigger picture. I think in in our community, it's a very small community here. Um, you know, we have left left less than half a half a million people in population. Uh, what more the business community? So I think if we take that type of approach, that more customized approach, whereby you know you're actually sharing these honest feelings with the business community, um, you can see some. You can actually move the needle a little bit um, in the favor of inclusive business. So I think this is something that. Um, that uh, business organizations should take very seriously um, and at the same time be supportive of what it means to to have to create impact for your community so i think it's just it's just the nuances of how do we deliver that messaging um, is would be one of the steps that we would i suppose take uh, to move ahead you know this whole idea and the the whole purpose of um, inclusive business coaching thank you marcus no thank you um, so returning back to, to Namsoon, you had frozen, you're, un, you, you're de defrosted now. Uh, please, uh, you can continue. Yeah, my, my apologies. I have no idea what happened there, but uh, it, this always happens when you're just about to speak, I think, for some reason. Um, so look, I, I, I wanted to, I was saying, I wanted to take the opportunity to answer one of the questions that was posed, and I think that's quite uh, uh, interesting. And then, and then answer your question about the tool, right? Which is, what does good look like? Uh, it, for inclusive businesses, and and in in the ASEAN context, I think that uh, you know there is uh, definitely uh, for inclusive businesses flourish. I, I think we need a conducive ecosystem. Uh, we talked about public private sector participation and collaboration is critical in that. I think the point around there's a lot of stuff, uh, or they're starting to see quite a bit of stuff happening at the national level. Uh, but again, with all things with ASEAN, to the extent that we can, and that that comment made, I think, by one of the participants around. You know, are there ways where we can share kind of even funding or best practices across? I think that that you know the ability to kind of uh, be impactful and build inclusive businesses across ASEAN uh, will be much more powerful. We can we can kind of uh, align ourselves and and share uh, across the the ASEAN uh, region, right? So a few the key elements obviously is looking at uh, different policies, the grants, the incentives to encourage more inclusive businesses to emerge and scale across. I think Caleb talked about if you move into a different geography, then what do you have to deal with? And, and kind of to the extent, uh, I'm not talking about harmonizing, but, but kind of synchronizing to some extent, uh, some of these uh, regulatory uh, um, uh, kind of um, support, right? Um, and I think the other one is just around the business leaders and the finance community and other stakeholders, organizations, NGOs, and others, you know, to take ownership of developing these inclusive business models for economic growth and, and to be able to kind of drive uh, social impact at scale. Uh, just quickly on the, the other question around, um, you know, it, it, are people using our tools? Or do we use it ourselves? You know, it will be criminal if I said we, we weren't using it. I, I think the reality is that, uh, especially when, um, no, so we, I, I give you an example. We had this, uh, we've, we've had this growth navigator, which is a program that we help uh, entrepreneurs scale their businesses. So we look at different things, especially as you become uh, bigger in scale and the, the complexity of the business or, the, or the, the markets that you have to deal with or customer set becomes much bigger. Uh, you know, how, what do you look at? Uh, you know, what legal entity structure do you need to kind of put in place? What are the regulations you have to navigate? What, is, what are the funding requirements, even the internal organization around how you should be, what talent should you bring on board? 
Uh, how do you interact with external stakeholders? How do you leverage technology and data, uh, which is quite important uh, in, in this time and age? So that, that was something that we've always uh, kind of had, and, and that had a pretty good uptake in helping on entre entrepreneurs scale their business. What's different now is that we've nuanced those tools, right? And we, we work collaborative with, with companies like Acumen uh, to be able to kind of uh, put an inclusive business slant on it, just because to your point, Marcus, this is the this is the this is really part front and center in this time time you know uh, perhaps you, you were kind of banging at doors uh, some years back but this is this is definitely the time to kind of uh, get the adoption up that makes sense no 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 absolutely and and uh, I think for me what I've experienced with with consultancies firm one, one, once consultancy firms start putting up frameworks that means they see a business opportunity there and I think that's probably the best uh, gauge we, we can have. Uh, that uh, there is uh, like a willingness to pay. And then going back to what we had uh, discussed uh, before, um, businesses don't have any qualms to, to spend money on, on expansion advisory, on, on tax consulting and on all these things. Um, but I think it's, it's very encouraging to see that, that there's an increasing now interest also in the impact space on to see on... Um, on like inclusive business um, uh, coaching or uh, or advisory. Um, on the other um, hand, we, we've sort of um, now talked about the, about the need of it, like some some elements. Um, if you could devise sort of the perfect business coaching program, what kind of ingredients would that need to have? Um, Callum, you, you, you had mentioned like regulatory uh, issues is, is very important uh, to you. Um, from the past experiences that the connection to the base of the pyramid um, is, is key. What other aspects would you sort of design if you could design your perfect program? I think having some kind of basic introductory program that can be delivered via cohort as we were talking about before, would be really good to start with. Some, something where the key principles are, of inclusive business are communicated um, and then slowly transitioning into a one-on-one -on -one regimen where the, the coaching starts to examine the, the business model, um, the business, the company's organizational structure, and other relevant points and and trying to see uh, how how they can how they can really help them improve there in our particular case i think it would have also been very useful to uh help with networking specifically so not only just um inclusive business coaching but inclusive networks if that is a thing um helping helping us out with getting in touch with the right people, but also doing it in an ethical and tasteful manner. That's, that's good points. Um, Nick Hafimi, how, how would you design the perfect business coaching program? Um, I, guess, I guess for me, um, being able to do a lot of parallel, you know, things in parallel, you know, not just developing policy could work alongside your living laboratory, uh, that type of adaptive learning uh, and adaptive, you know, blending of experiences would be would be really good if if you know if we you had a sort of like a perfect program. Um, I totally agree with what Calum said that networking is a crucial part of of any type of business model ecosystem, whatever you want to call it, because that's the first um, door opener for any type of um, of, of social enterprise or, or any business that wants to step into that that realm um, and I think for me the the ultimate bit that would be the sweetener to it is the fact that we're all learning off each other um, and with digital age you know that is so easy for us to now interact with anyone in that field uh, you know if you if you wanted to come up and, and and just talk about the experiences that you've had in running, you know, really good agricultural programs, um, the next thing you just have to do: record yourself, put yourself either on YouTube, TikTok, whatever it is, 
um, and I'm sure somebody will just Google, grab it off you, and and uh, you know basically implement that in their in their solutions. So I think this is the the beauty of digitalization, um, and as we move forward. Um, within, you know, in, in, in the way that we interact with each other now, uh, we're actually all learning off each other. I think we need to remember that, that you know, um, I have a 19 year old, he's learning everything most of the time. It's not asking mom, it's actually saying, oh, I'm just gonna YouTube this and I'll just do it from scratch. You know, so I think that's, that's we've got to incorporate that um, into the mechanisms that we use as um, institutions, organizations, whatever it is, uh, because that's going to be the quickest way that we can uplift um, that level of society because nothing beats learning by watching. And no matter what, we're still very raw at that level of human interaction that we learn that we learn the best when we see how somebody else has done it. So I think this is one element that uh, that can really propel um, what we're trying to do, especially I, and I think you know, back to the focus markers with with inclusive business, this is where that's going to be that extra um, trump card that will help you move um, your programs forward and what we're trying to move uh, forward with inclusive business coaching. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's the, the, that's excellent uh, point, uh, Nick Hafimi, because um, as I'd mentioned before, I think we are still, or I am personally also still stuck in my sort of workshop face-to-face uh, -face mode. Um, Sometimes going into the, um, uh, also like going directly to the BOP, doing human centric design and these things. Um, but I think the, the world out there, and I can see it with my 10 year old, uh, who, who's also saying, yeah, just open YouTube to me and I check it out myself. Um, I, I have not really incorporated yet. And, and I think this is still a, a way to go. Maybe it's generational, uh, but um, Namsu, do you see yourself in, on TikTok? Uh, doing a, uh, a dance around inclusive business soon? No, I, I don't do the dance on TikTok, but I, I check to see if my son is doing the dance on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I actually wanted to just uh, expand upon maybe what the others have said, right? So it, it, the, the whole point around learning and uh, our experience has been when we coach entrepreneurs, uh, it's always more effective to kind of make it practical, right? So to the extent we can uh, share a successful case studies, that's great. Hearing it from EY is fantastic. Hearing it from another entrepreneur that's been coached by EY is, is 100 times better, right? So what we've done with our programs is to bring in kind of successful entrepreneurs and, you know, get their time. Some of them have been fantastic in respect, volunteering their time so that they can come back and give back uh, you know, and, and just kind of play back the experiences they had. Now, it's never going to be 100% the same, uh, but some challenges are, are um, you know, would be similar in terms of, you know, kind of, you know, whether it's dealing with regula regulatory uh, navigation or, or kind of, you know, working best with, with government or, or looking at, you know, how, to, how do you get certain business cases to work, right, um, in spite of the challenging economics. So, so I, I think we, we've spent a lot of time cultivating that network. And I, I think it's always good to hear, you know, people, we, I, I see just one last point. I see quite a lot of kind of good questions here. Every time we run one of these uh, programs, I'm not sure how it, it is for the others. We, we always get good challenging questions is around, you know, you know, you can talk about theory, you can framework, that's fantastic. But show us where have you got this to work and how can you help us, right? And, and I think just leveraging on that entrepreneur network, uh, we have been kind of, maybe slightly ahead of the curve or been more successful is, is, is very useful. Oh, that's, that's certainly true. And, and um, it relates, relates very much to the development of uh, the IB agenda in, in ASEAN. Um, when we uh, like work together with AXME, we also put together as a first step, a group of 20 uh, brave policymakers uh, from the 10 ASEAN member states um, to do a, uh, like a capacity um, training program around inclusive business policy. And, and the way I designed it was I was always asking them to bring the examples. And uh, it's, it's not that because I was lazy, uh, do it myself, but I have exactly the same experience as you, Namso, and it's so much more convincing if a peer says something than the best consultant in the world. Not that I am that, but just to put it into relation uh, that... Um, this is good, and, and it also works uh, across regions. Um, I, I um, during the um, uh, the second 
uh, ASEAN, ASEAN Business Summit, we brought a, a group of Nigerian policymakers uh, to, to Bangkok and uh, put them in the room with, with the ASEAN policymakers. And that's been one of the, like, the best workshops I've attended because it was so intense. It was so good that after eight hours, the Nigerian policymakers walked out and said, yes, we want to do that. Hmm? So, so the power of convincing is, is definitely there. And that's uh, probably something we, we should be considering when designing these business coaching, using uh, the peers as, as teachers or as mentors to have like a combined mentorship coaching uh, program to, um, to bring this, uh, uh, yeah, to, 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 to strengthen the message and uh, increase um, like so believability, uh, so to say, uh, in, in the tools and in the concepts uh, that are being uh, discussed. Um, so Britt, from, from your uh, perspective, uh, how is BOP Inc's Instagram and TikTok channel uh, developing? Um, we got really, really good colleagues on this. So I think that it's developing quite well. We're just not on TikTok because of the privacy concerns. We are a little bit against that platform in that respect. So that's not gonna happen. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're always trying to share as much of our learnings as possible. So if you go to our website or if you look on our YouTube channel, you can get a lot of free contents. And some of the trainings we've developed in programs like Innovations Against Poverty are just on YouTube and you can, you can follow them and uh, at least get that for free uh, and accessible to anyone. Maybe uh, Marcus to get back to your question on the ideal program, because this is uh, this is where I get very excited. I think most of the elements you guys mentioned already, uh, I would put in as well. I think maybe just to, to, to summarize and add, I think there's a training uh, element that you want to include and online training and blended learning is very powerful there, just to get the basics and to get kind of the, the topics that you need to address in the broad sense covered. Um, sharing those success stories of the entrepreneurs that have uh, pulled this off and are successful, I think is very important. Um, and then in the coaching, I think it's, it's the best setup I've seen is where you have an IB consultant that's a bit more broader that can talk to the business and see what they need and really identify the needs, but then have a kind of flexible pool of experts you can tap into based on whatever the company needs and get them in and help out like maybe a finance expert or maybe a legal expert or so those programs tend to work work the best in my opinion um partnership linkages uh, like Callum was saying is I think also a big one and and especially when you work with local local partners that's something that everyone can really benefit from the linkages that these uh, these organizations can make um in my ideal world, I would have a setup where you have all these generic things and then kind of sub impact topics within inclusive business. So like circular economy and how to put that in, in action for the BOP, having some women empowerment elements in there, having some financial inclusion in there, having some digital inclusion in there, because they're all topics that are quite specific um, in the challenges that the businesses face that are working on them. So if you can group them, uh, create that peer learning uh, and then link to all the stakeholders, right? What we tend to do is like have banks, have investors come in, talk to the entrepreneurs, have the government involved to see what kind of regulatory environment uh, is needed for these entrepreneurs. Um, so yeah, in an ideal world, I think I would like to have all those elements. Uh, you don't always get them all, but uh, that's, that's, I think, the, the ideal setup for coaching. No. No, I think we, we've got a good good selection now. And uh, there are some offers from uh, support already coming in on, on the chat box here from Oxfam in Vietnam, uh, who has been doing it for over seven years and uh, got uh, 70 inclusive uh, SMEs involved. And yes, please do share. Um, I think the, 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 the one, or one of the aspects why, why I love being in this inclusive business space is there's still a lot of sharing happening. Um, I, I was previously in the private sector in the IT industry, and there was no sharing at all. Everybody was sitting on their business model, uh, on their uh, like supplier contracts. Um, there was no collaboration at all. It was a very competitive uh, field. 
Um, I think an inclusive business, um, there is the, a bigger pre-competitive space uh, where sharing uh, can happen, especially as the field is, is so big, even among the companies that we talk to, uh, if they're in the, in the same space, they still talk about their business models because they say the overall, the BOP, there's 4.5 billion uh, people, a five, uh, $5 trillion market opportunity. And I will never be able to have a monopoly on all of this. So, so there's a lot of space left still for others. And there's a lot of willingness uh, to, to share um, ideas on business models. Uh, and um, that is something taking from, from discussion uh, we just had, how powerful those uh, sharings are, uh, learnings from the companies themselves. That's probably something that we uh, should be looking to integrate into, uh, into the business coaching that we have uh, seen. So what I'm trying to do now is just to end on the dots because we will be joined uh, very soon by the other group uh, to have the closing uh, session here. Um, I would like to thank wholeheartedly my panelists and for this fantastic session. I've really enjoyed this and I think we came out with some learnings, some insights for the future on how to develop effective inclusive business coaching. Uh, I'd like to encourage our uh, great audience to uh, find the emoji for the applauding hands for our great panel that we have uh, had uh, today. It was a real pleasure uh, being with you uh, today. And um, I just want to make like one very last round, um, your last words. You've got sort of uh, like a sentence each, not even a minute, uh, because we have to, so your, your last sentence um, on inclusive business in ASEAN. And let's start with the Honorable Nick Hafimi. Um, just my last sentence, it's, uh, look, let's jointly do this together. Thank you. Good. Uh, Brett. Yeah, I want to um, join that statement, honestly. I think it's very good to see that it, within ASEAN, there's so much knowledge sharing going on and so many stakeholders pushing together. So let's uh, keep that momentum moving. Thank you. Callum? Yeah, I'll steal from one of our company values. So democratize lessons, democratize information, democratize everything and just help each other out. Thank you, and Nam Soon? Uh, I, I would say we, we kind of need to come together. Uh, doesn't matter whether we're a business leader, you know, organization that we're in, we, we're gonna lead the charge. You almost be like an activist, right, I think. Uh, for our organizations, for our sector, for our economies, our country, uh, you know, the, the whole concept of creating long-term value and inclusive business, uh, I think it's really important. So let's come together. Well, I think I could not think of a better uh, closing statement. So I'll just let it stand there as it is. And, and sure, I will take you up on this and, and all of you. You can see the clapping. Uh, we got uh, great feedback, wonderful session, powerful session, great. So this is, the applause is yours. And with that, I am handing over again to our moderator Fadli, I think. Thank you so much.